The next speaker is Evan Bacon. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with Evan Bacon due to his prolific activity on Tinder or Google Maps reviews. <laughs> uh, Evan really though is one of the like nicest and hardest working people that I know. I think he's one of the people that I would say probably needs to be actually like less nice sometimes and probably less hardworking. Um, he joined us a couple of years ago after stalking uh, Expo employee Twitter accounts for a long time and building a bunch of really cool apps. He made some games like uh, Pillar Valley, which you can find on the App Store. He made a Crossy Road re-implementation, which he was forced to take down due to <laughs> the publisher not being particularly happy about that. Um, come on out, Evan, just plug it in. Um, and yeah, today he's going to be here talking about Expo for Web, which Charlie just gave an intro to, and Evan will explain in greater detail. Here we go. There you go. <laughs> All right, what's up, guys? Uh, this isn't my actual first slide. I, I, this is my actual first slide. I just needed to sneak it past rehearsal. Uh, so, I am Evan Bacon, as Brent just described kind of inaccurately. He said I'm very nice and good at programming, and it's not so. Uh, I work full-time on Expo, which is a universal app development platform. Uh, it's uh, super exciting. I really enjoy it, working on Expo. Before coming to Expo, I worked at a company called Frog Design. I worked on the SiriusXM radio app, and uh, we used lots of tools to prototype and uh, try to iterate through this, uh, things like Ionic and Xamarin, and uh, eventually finding Expo, and I just really fell in love with Expo. And then kind of in my spare time, I would make a lot of Expo projects and just post them up on the internet. Things like, I mean, this is the crossy road that Brent was just talking about that the team made me take down because they were very upset with how accurate it looked. And I just wanted to like push the boundaries and see. I mean, like I also made the Timberman one, and no one had a problem with that. But you know, whatever. Uh, so eventually, Charlie reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to work on Expo, which of course uh, I definitely did. Expo is my dream job. Absolutely love it. Uh, so since joining Expo, I've like completely hijacked their YouTube channel, and I have filled it with, I, I guess what you could call content, and. It's, yeah, I mean, before this it was like an educated look at Expo, and now it's like how pull requests were meant to be opened. Uh, when I'm not working on Expo, I am a Lego master builder, so I it would make these giant Lego sculptures of various superheroes that I was interested in in my bedroom uh, alone. And <laughs> I think kind of just the main takeaway from this is that I... Uh, never go outside, ever. Uh, so my Twitter account is Bacon Bricks. Important to know so you can promptly block me on it. Uh, just kind of like one less fanatic to deal with. Uh, but yeah, that's it for the intro. Now we'll get to the actual serious part. Uh, so universal app development, right? With Expo, you can make iOS, you can make Android apps, and it works you know, very well. Uh, a lot of Companies are using it, and uh, it's just a lot of fun to use. But uh, Expo, it provides this abstract set of APIs that can be applied to any platform. Uh, most notably, it's applied to iOS and Android because of React Native, but it doesn't need to be that way, uh, which is why recently we've been looking at React Native for Web. Now, if you're not familiar with React Native for Web, it is a framework that was made by Nick Gallagher to make the Twitter PWA, or the Twitter Lite PWA, and it works really, really well. Uh, it's actually, it works surprisingly well. Uh, even after working on the project, I was like blown away by uh, all the little nuanced features that make it uh, work, uh, make it optimal to create a PWA in. And uh, uh, obviously, I'm not the first to have discovered this. A lot of huge companies like Major League Soccer and Uber and the Times have made their mobile and desktop PWAs using React Native for Web. So it's just like, in the community, if you're a React Native developer, you've probably heard of React Native for Web, and a lot of people have gone about actually implementing it. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into how it works. 
if you're curious, Nick Gallagher has a really nice talk at React Rally about you know, the style sheet API, which is a very optimal CSS in JS library. He made normalized.css, and so the style sheet API, he has like a, a nice benchmark test which demonstrates uh, all the popular CSS and JS libraries and shows how the style sheet library in React Native for web is one of the fastest. Uh, and the accessibility is just also really well baked out. I hope I didn't ex spell accessibility wrong just there. Uh, so what's the catch? Uh, if it's really this good, why isn't everyone using it for the React Native apps? I mean, if it works with the same API, if you can implement it the same way, and if things like Twitter are using it, why isn't everyone using React, React Native for web? And uh, after looking a little bit closer, I found a couple of issues, and they weren't very clear issues, and they weren't really related to React Native for web, but more about like the ecosystem and how React Native for web integrates with React Native. So, for instance, not enough libraries. I mean, if you use React Native and you use Expo, you learn that just you need every single library. Uh, and it, it wasn't very clear, because there's like the DOM API, and then there is native browser functionality. And it's hard for people to distinguish what is that browser functionality and what is uh, the ubiquitous JavaScript that you can use across platforms. The tree shaking was pretty fragile. If you did something like import an unsupported library from React Native for Web, it would break the tree shaking and it would pull in everything and you would have this massive bundle size. Uh, there was a lot of bad practices, not in React Native for Web, but just in the community, things that worked on React Native, but then when employed with Web, it just made things break. Uh, so I'll give you an example of this. This is the Fonts API. Uh, when you use fonts in React Native for Web, you need to create a typeface with CSS, and then you may need to update your Webpack config. And this is different from Native because you have a completely separate implementation. There is no CSS in Native. So the only place I actually found this documented was on this issue for React Native for Web, which was like, how do I add custom fonts? And this one guy suggests adding an Expo like API to load custom fonts. Uh, and then, you know, Nick Gallagher suggests something like Expo for Web, which will work like Create React App and Create React Native App. And if you're not familiar, Create React Native App is like an alias for Expo CLI. So that is what we'll be talking about today. Create uh, Expo for Web is a very long intro animation. I just kind of took the slider and slid it all the way up. And Keynote doesn't let you skip, so there's really no going back on that one. So this is going to be the first extensive look at Expo for Web. Uh, it's currently in preview, but by the end of April 2019, it will be out of preview, and it should be stable enough for you to mess around with. I mean, currently you can mess around with it, but it should be stable enough to use it in tandem with your iOS and your Android applications. And uh, what is Expo for Web? Well, it's a lot of things, right? There's no tangible package. It's not like, oh, Yarn add Expo Web. Uh, we had to kind of add web integration to Every single module that Expo has, we needed to add web support to our Babel preset. We needed to update the Webpack config and then add CLI features. We're going to get into each one of these. So the first one is the unimodules. Now, if you're not familiar with what a unimodule is, um, I'm sure you'll be familiar by the end of the day. But it is the universal uh, abstract APIs that you can use on whatever platform you want. Uh, and the way these work with React Native for Web is essentially you can use React Native for Web to create really robust views and images and text. And then the unimodules provide things like the camera, the gradient, the font, these abstract APIs that you can apply anywhere. Uh, I actually have this Instagram demo that I've been working on. It's a little finicky, but there's a QR code if you guys want to check it out in the web. I'll leave it there for a second so you scan into it. I'll also just like show it to you here. So right here, I've got this like Instagram demo running in the web. You see, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Instagram, but uh, it's got like the scroll bar at the bottom. Notice there's like some little, little jank here and there, but you can like pull up the scroll bar and scroll around. So things work fairly nicely. And then of course, this works really nicely on uh, native. And also have this other Expo APIs demo, if you're curious and checking that out. But now I'm going to look at these in depth. 
So I divided the API into kind of four categories. Uh, the reason I did this was so that my talk had some structure. Uh, the first one is font loading. These are the direct abstraction APIs. Uh, like we were talking about earlier, it's kind of inconvenient that you might have to load fonts one way on native and then load them a totally different way uh, on web. So with Expo, you can now just load them the exact same way everywhere using a JS library. There's no CSS required and all the assets are handled ubiquitously across all the platforms, which I think is really nice. Uh, other direct abstractions are things like SVG, SQLite, uh, printing, <laughs> you can read. But uh, what, what these do is essentially like, you, you're probably familiar with the fact that SVG is just supported in web by default. So it seems odd to use like a higher level abstraction. But the reason for this is so that if you use Expo's version of SVG, then it works on native as well as uh, web. So kind of like in this particular case, it seems a little odd because it's like, I can just use linear gradient as a CSS prop. Why do I need to use it uh, as a component? And uh, that's the reason. So the next one's the emulated functionality. Now this is going to be functionality which exists natively in the browser, but it works a little differently than it does natively on mobile. So we just try to match it as closely as possible. Uh, Uh, so Image Picker is a great example of this. Uh, as you can see here, this is the Image Picker API in web, where with the Image Picker API, you can be like, I want to pick an image. So you do like launch camera async, and I just want photos or not videos. And there's a lot of these features which are built in there, things like specifying just video or just photo, but they work very differently across browsers, so it's kind of inconvenient. You need to be like an expert to know about all these different attributes and the way that you want to initialize them. So it's just nice to have them wrapped up in one uh, ubiquitous API. I'm going to say ubiquitous a lot today. Uh, and the way this actually works is by injecting the input before the transaction and then removing the input after the transaction. This is because the API is static, so you do like image picker dot launch camera async and you don't have time to add it to your uh, view. Now, of course, you're probably thinking uh, this makes it hard for screen readers to find, and you're very correct. Uh, but that's where the great React Native for Web uh, accessibility stuff comes into play. You can just set the accessibility label, and the screen reader can find you again. So everything works together really nicely, and you have very convenient APIs. Another one that I really like that Charlie was just showing is the camera API. This one is actually surprisingly very nice. So on mobile, you can do things like flip the camera. You can set the picture size. Uh, with Android, you have tons of functionality, actually. You have almost access to all of the native camera functionality from the web, which blew my mind. I thought I was like hallucinating when I built it. Uh, I have a little demo of using this native functionality on Android in the web. So first, you see I like change the autofocus. It like blurs the image. I can flip the camera, and it's me again. And then I can zoom in natively, like up to seven times, or at least on this particular device. And then I can turn on the, the torch, which is just like the flashlight on the back of the phone. Uh, so lots of functionality. Uh, but it uses the exact same API on native. So if you were to build your native camera, you will get the optimal camera in the web. And uh, finally, there's the synthetic functionality. I mean, not finally. Third to last, there is the synthetic functionality. This is going to be functionality that doesn't exist natively, but we tried to recreate it as best we could. So ViewShot is a great example of this. Notice that, OK, so the way this works is you have uh, a, a, an element from React, and then you pass that into the ViewShot API. And then ViewShot will take that element, and it will try to reconstruct it on the canvas, and then draw that canvas to an image. So is extremely prone to errors. But I mean, at least it kind of works. Kind of. It very rarely works. Uh, but it's nice. So then there's also like image manipulator. You know, if you like search how do I rotate an image 90 degrees in web, you're going to get like CSS rotate it 90 degrees or something. And that's not quite what you're looking for probably. Like maybe you want to actually manipulate it or transform it or scale it. And you can do that with the image manipulator. Again, another Canvas implementation, so it's got its bugs. Uh, and then there's the fallback API. If you're familiar with Expo, there's stuff like 
the, um, the action sheet, where on iOS there is a native action sheet, and then on Android, uh, the current implementation doesn't have an action sheet, so it just builds one customly using React Native views and text, touchables, and same with the blur view. It's not blurry, it's just kind of a low opacity view. Very hard to tell because I don't show that it's a brighter view beforehand, but whatever. Uh, the reason for the blur view thing is because uh, blur view and web, it like applies it to the view and not as an overlay above the view. You can technically do that on Safari, but nowhere else. So you're more than likely going to get this interaction. And finally, there are the unsupported features. These are the things that we just couldn't make work in the web. Uh, this is going to be stuff like the calendar API, contacts, media library. Uh, you guys can still read. Uh, and uh, for these, we just need to like, think of ways to fail gracefully. Uh, so we've got three different kind of main methods for failing gracefully. The first one is the is available. Uh, and this is, you can find this in like the sensors API, where it's like if barometer is not available, you can detect that by running this function. Uh, other things you can actually hide behind a permission. So for instance, on camera, you can't use the camera unless you've ask the user for permission. So we can very conveniently say, like, if there is no camera on this device, then it will just return unavailable as opposed to denied or granted. And then lastly, it will just throw an error. Uh, so if you were to run a method which doesn't do anything, it throws a custom error called the unavailability error, which will tell you this exact method is not uh, usable on the web. And then you can go and figure out how to adjust your code, you know to adjust for that. Uh, so the next big thing that we have is the Babel preset. Now, this is a very important part in making uh, an effective and streamlined uh, website, right? So by default, you're going to be using the React Native Babel preset if you're making like a React Native init app. And then there's also the Babel plugin React Native for web, which will convert your code in web to make it, you know, tree shake certain things, but not everything. So we made Babel Preset Expo, which you don't have to use, by the way. You can actually just use these, and you won't get any of the things that I'm about to show you. But we made Babel Preset Expo to do a couple of things. The first one being that uh, it delegates tasks between Webpack and Metro. So if you're not familiar with React Native, uh, it uses the Metro bundler, whereas React and most of the web uses the Webpack bundler. So what we needed to do was create a system which could run both your native app and your web app using two separate bundlers. Uh, it's kind of a huge hack. Uh, so consider this block of code. Notice we're just importing text from React Native, and then we've got a component that we're exporting with some text in it. But we're not importing view, we're not importing image, we're not importing scroll view, so we don't want any of those in our final bundle. We want those all to be removed. And uh, if we were to build this, we're going to get something like this. This is our, um, our analyzer. Sorry, this is not what that block looks like. This is the analyzer, the breakdown of the node modules. Notice that it's like 53 kilobytes gzip, uh, the majority of that being React DOM. And then we've got a few other libraries over here, but it's uh, accurately shaken out like flat list and image and view. Uh, so consider this block of code without Babel Preset Expo. All we're doing is importing constants from Expo, but Expo has a ton of modules in it. So without Babel Preset Expo, it doesn't know how to remove all of those extra modules. So you end up with like 308 extra gzipped kilobytes, and it just imports like everything, and it's a huge mess, and it took a long time to solve this. So the reason for this is because of the whole Webpack and Metro thing. Metro optimizes its code very differently from Webpack in the sense that it uses the require statements to lazy load modules, whereas Webpack, uh, all our tree shaking, will look for the import export ES module keywords, and it will use those to remove any modules that you have not imported. So on a lot of the libraries that are popular in React Native, what I did was I just made the, uh, the build step generate both files. Uh, again, hacks. Uh, it would be nice if there was a way to just use one bundler, but currently there isn't. So now if you consider this same block of code using Babel Preset Expo, you're going to end up with something like this, where it's just two extra kilobytes because we're only using constants from Expo and everything else has been deleted, which uh, I'm really proud of. So the, the next thing is just the CLI. 
Uh, this is the step which is like create React app, create React Native app. Uh, so to use Expo for web, I have this examples repo set up where I show how you can use it with create React app, you can use it with React Native init or Expo init. Uh, the Expo unimodules are very modular and you can basically put them anywhere that uses React, which is really nice. Uh, I've got a QR code there if you want to scan it. But to use web, all you need to do is run expo start, and it will fire up Metro or Webpack based off of your configuration. And then to actually generate the static website, all you need to do is expo build web, and that will generate all your files for you. No having to mess with Webpack unless you want to. And now this part, there's a lot of nuance here. I was told I probably shouldn't show this, but whatever. I wanted to show it anyways. So what we've got here is the basic blank project that's been initialized and then uploaded to Netlify. And you'll notice a lot of green up here. There's uh, hundreds across the board in Lighthouse, and that is because uh, it's accurately cheese shaking and it's accurately splitting the bundle and providing all of your headers and your PWA features. So just by default, Expo is giving you a really fresh start where, I mean, it's up to you at that point to make it slower. But uh, uh, Expo isn't holding you back, which I really enjoy. Now, publishing is also really important. If you've used Expo, you know that publishing is made easier by Expo. I won't say it's easy because iTunes Connect is still very difficult to use, but uh, Expo does a lot to try and you know, make it a nice experience. And so with web, we wanted to do the same thing. On that web examples repo that I just showed you, I have examples of how to upload using Amplify now, Netlify. I gotta stop reading off the lists, uh, and then like GitHub pages. Now, the Amplify one in particular is really nice because as soon as we put it out, the Amplify team had added integration directly. So if you were to like connect your repo to Amplify, uh, it will automatically detect that it's using Expo and then deploy and host your project with zero configuration. So actually making a project and putting it on the internet for people to use is ridiculously easy, which is really nice because when you make an app, you want people to mess with it immediately. You don't want to have to wait a few weeks for the App Store approval. So it's, it's nice that you at least have this kind of web option to do something like that. Now finally, there is the Webpack config. And the Webpack config is, it's very important. It binds kind of all these concepts together. So much so that I like probably put a, should have put it like sooner in the talk, but I didn't. So here at the end, we're gonna be talking about the Webpack config. Now, a big complaint that I see a lot on the internet is that default Webpack configs are hard to customize, hard to extend. And if you've used Create React app, React scripts will provide, um, uh, a default Webpack config, and if you want to extend that, you need to eject from that. So to combat some of that upfront, we have a lot of customization moved into the app.json, so you can like specify how you want your build process to work, if you want to enable things like broadly compression, if you want to define how your service worker works, all that stuff uh, easily accessible and manipul manipulatable through the app.json. And if you're not into proprietary systems that I make up, kind of off a whim. You can also just use Webpack. So if you were to create like a Webpack config.js in your root folder, then Expo CLI will automatically look for that in favor of the default config. So you could do things like import Webpack config and then merge in or clobber whatever features you don't like. Or you could just create your own Webpack config from scratch. I, the point is that you're, like, you're not tied in, you're not locked in, you can do whatever you want, whatever you're comfortable with. Now. The Webpack config, the Expo Webpack config, it provides a lot of very cool features. One of my favorites is the steps for a progressive web app. What it will do is um, it will infer a lot of information. So here I've listed the steps to making a progressive web app in Expo. Uh, it's very simple. So because a progressive web app is really just like this gray zone between a native app and a website, and you make both of those things with Expo, Webpack config has a plugin which can this just go through and infer the optimal amount of information for your PWA without any extra added work to you. Examples of this are things like the splash screen generation. It can generate all your splash screens using the same protocol that we use on native. Uh, so like your iOS PWA will look very similar to your native app. Uh, 
Without this, of course, it can be very difficult. There's this seven-step process that you need to try every single time you want to experiment with your new splash screen size. And uh, I found this out, too. This is really weird. You can also set the wrong splash screen height, and then it will just render at a different height in the multitasker. So very broken. And it's nice that Expo like, uh, just makes you not have to know about that. Uh, and you never would have known about that if I didn't just tell you now. So you also get your desktop PWA by default. Uh, so if you want a desktop app and you don't want to use Electron, you can do that as well. You get an optimal Android PWA. This gets into the territory of like the things that I was talking about with inference. Uh, so for instance, you can get the native app install banner automatically generated because you made your app in Expo. So Expo already knows about the app, where the app is, what the package name is. So you can automatically be like in your website, hey, do you want to download the Expo app instead? Not the Expo app but the app that you made in Expo. Uh, it would be weird if I made all of everyone's apps just be like, hey, download Expo. And my Crossy Road clone. So you just get like tons of features. Uh, Expo, PWA integration, just everywhere. And you get a maximized experience with little to no effort to you. Now, uh, there's also a lot of problems. I mean, not a lot of problems, but there are some problems. And I wanted to show you guys some of these so it would like combat a lot of the fanboying I've been doing over my own code. Uh, and uh, I really like these problems, too. They're very, they all come with animations, so lovely to look at. So this first one is going to be, uh, well, these are all going to be animation-driven problems. Animation is a big struggling point for React Native Web right now, and there's ways to fix these. I, we just haven't employed any of them yet. So this is the Instagram. Uh, transition. Notice with the ball, first I'm going to scroll it. It's using a flat list animation. I'm going to scroll the ball and the animation rolls, and then I'm going to animate it manually. So notice it scrolls very smoothly as a circle, and then if I rotate, it just it drops frames, and it's not very pretty. That's kind of a, a cheating problem because it's not a big problem, and I'm acting like it's the only one. So. Uh, a lot of these same problems existed in React Native, and then when these two libraries came onto the scene, it fixed a lot of those problems, things like Gesture Handler and Reanimated. Uh, and so what I tried to do was, because these aren't in web yet, I tried to recreate some core animations that you can make with those two libraries in web. So this next one's going to be the cube transition from Instagram. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but basically what happens is uh, there will be a cube, and you spin the cube to go to the next image. So I made this with the flat list and animated and pan uh, responder. So let me just play this real quick. So if you look very carefully, you'll notice there is a few frames that are being dropped. Just kind of around here. To the untrained eye, this may look buttery smooth. But uh, I can assure you, it's not. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, so there's still some work to be done. But I can fix these all fairly easily. Just uh, you know, remind me on Twitter at my new Twitter account, uh, KZZZF. <laughs> Don't let the name or the face or the years of experience or the job title throw you off. It's definitely me. Uh, so I also wanted to kind of talk about third-party integrations. These are just libraries that work with React Native Web and then work by extension with Expo Web uh, very nicely. Things like React Navigation, for instance, which is what I was using for the Instagram prototype. You've got the drawer navigator, the tab, the stack navigator, and all that stuff just works across both platforms in a very clean and concise way. And then there's also extensions, things like the switch navigator, which will uh, add the routing to your URL bar as you move through the navigator. Uh, I also really like this library by Callstack called React Native Paper. Uh, it's a material design library that works. And by the way, these are all web sketches. I shouldn't have put them in iPhone frames. But these are all uh, web components that work the same way in native as they do in web. Uh, so you get things like the material design pulses and material design interactions, because you know there could just never be enough material design in the community. And Flutter is very popular, so I've got to do some of that as well. Anyways, guys, that is all I have for you today. That is all I prepared. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed. If you did, uh, here's some Twitter accounts you could follow. So there's the Expo one, which we'll tweet about, you know, Expo web stuff. 
And then Nicholas Gallagher, who created React Native for web, uh, I mean, none of this would have been possible if he hadn't done that. Uh, so he tweets about like React Native for web updates. And then if for some reason you guys want to keep up with, you know what, I'm just actually going to take it off the screen. Thanks so much.